Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics, or welcome back. Very nice to see you all here. Uh, this is a special one-off webinar about the future of the EU fiscal framework related to the week of debate that took place last week, organized by a network called Fiscal Matters. I will share the link with you. Um, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at TNI, the Transnational Institute, and I also work for a think tank called Sustainable Finance Lab. And I'll be your host today, together with Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Colesmith, uh, our web developer, Kees Hudig uh, from the website globalinfo.nl, and Jenny Pannebecker, who is a communications officer at SOMO as well. And they're working very hard today, as always, to make this webinar a success. So be before we start off with today's webinar, let me just tell you a little bit about Crash Course. So we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from numerous organizations, and we united at the start of the corona crisis in order to understand how the corona crisis has changed the world, and also to reflect on challenges uh, that we're facing and possible solutions. And I think this webinar of today is also very much forward-looking. Uh, so Crash Course is a platform, we have a website, and it's designed to open up the debates on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic, and ecological justice. And in order to do so, we invite global experts from all around the world to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system together in a just and democratic way. And in that way, we hope to democratize knowledge and give you the necessary tools to change the world. So in each webinar, we provide you with a one hour crash course on a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. We're also thinking of doing a fourth series uh, because we did three before, but that's yet to be decided. Uh, in any case, you can watch all our former webinars on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. And uh, so of this webinar, there will also be a recording, a podcast version, and a summary. Rodrigo, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, so welcome to this uh, episode uh, on fiscal matters. We we had a series of uh, of uh, web uh, of webinars before. One series was on uh, monetary policy, another on uh, debt crisis in the global south, uh, and another on big tech. And now we focus on Europe's uh, fiscal architecture and uh, problems that lie ahead. And I think it's important to go back uh, ten years ago. It has been ten years since the euro crisis and. The euro crisis marked an important shift. Before that, we had a, a period in which there was a lot of stimulation of the economy uh, after the global financial crisis. Uh, and after the euro crisis, we entered this long and dark period of austerity, which has done a lot of harm and damage uh, to Europe's society. Uh, so um, looking back, we can we see that most of the structural problems of the euro remain the same. Uh, and now, hopefully, uh, we are in the last part of this horrible pandemic. Um, we are seeing calls to end the stimuli program that came together with the pandemic and go back to normal. And this normal is uh, a fiscal hawk normal. Um, and this has the dangers in it to go back to a period of austerity. Um, so debt levels have increased as a result of interventions after the pandemic. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, what lies ahead of us dealing with uh, the massive investments that are required to combat climate change will require a rethinking of the whole fiscal framework in Europe. And um, this is, the, this is what we will discuss today, uh, and uh, yeah, this is a, a very exciting topic, I believe, and uh, very important because we are entering these debates right now in Europe. So, Sarah? Yeah, so we, before we start with that matter, um, just short practicalities. Um, the setup is as following, so Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker. Uh, who will present his uh, view. And thereafter, uh, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions for him, and that will take about 15, 20 minutes. 
And then the third, uh, third of uh, this session, there will be a round of questions from your side that will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. So we finish in exactly uh, one hour at uh, five o'clock. And I'd like to ask you to, well, introduce yourself in the chat, but also put your questions in the special Q&A window that you will find in the bottom of your screen during the webinar. And then we'll make a selection based upon those questions that are most favored, because if you like a question, you can endorse it by putting the thumbs up. So, Rodrigo, you have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yes, well, we are very happy to have uh, with us today, um, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, Ludovic Sutor Sorel, uh, who works at Finance Watch as a research and advocacy officer. Uh, he works on fiscal policy uh, and sustainable finance uh, and, and many of the areas around that. Uh, Ludovic was a member of the European Commission's technical expert group on sustainable finance, uh, invo involved in the creation of the EU uh, taxonomy for sustainable activities. Um, last week, he also gave uh, a, a very interesting workshop uh, well, with many participants on this very topic. Uh, so therefore, I would like to ask Ludovic to put on his camera and start his presentation. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Rodrigo. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation to, to discuss with you uh, today. So, yes, I'm Ludovic Storsorel. I'm working for Finance Watch as a research and campaign officer. And for the moment, I'm in charge of our work on fiscal policy and the reform of the European fiscal rule. So, I will directly share with you my screen, my presentation. Voilà. So um, this presentation is going to be based on the three reports we recently produced uh, this year on the European Fiscal uh, Framework. You can find them on our website, uh, financewatch.org. The first one is the European Fiscal Framework in five questions. The second one is about a guide on how to reform the European Economic Governance. It's more about legislative uh, sort of analysis of all the different pieces of what we call the maze, the this whole EU fiscal framework. And the last one, fiscal meteorology and masks about debunking eight tales about European public debt and fiscal rules. So today we're going to first to introduce why fiscal matters, what has changed in the, 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 the COVID crisis and why it's something that really uh, was a debate in uh, a workshop. Uh, we'll then uh, dive in into what we call the May. So what is the EU fiscal framework in itself? We unfortunately won't really have the time to dig into each and every detail, but we will have the time during the question or you can contact me after the, um, the event for, for more detail. Uh, then we will discuss the problem, what's wrong with the EU fiscal framework, and we'll start to, to dig into how to reform the EU fiscal framework and the main option uh, out there. So let's first start by why fiscal matters. I will just try to, to remind five key economic facts just so we all keep that in mind during the, the discussion. So the first one is the, the persistence of important funding gap. So last year, the European Commission uh, estimated in 2020 that the, the annual EU funding gap was about 700 billion per year for the EU uh, altogether. So on, on this uh, 707 billion, uh, you have the green funding gap, which is about 450 billion per year until 2030. So it's the, the money we lack to, to reach basically the EU environmental objective. So it's spending that we still need to find for renewable energy, construction, transport, environmental protection, circular economy, resource management. We also have additional uh, funding gap, for example, the one to avoid declining public capital stock, which basically mean our public infrastructure, school, hospital, and so on. The thing here is that uh, if we have this funding gap, it's not because we lack liquidity or lack capital. We, there is enough money and enough private money. It's really not the, the problem here. The problem we have here is the fact that uh, a large part of this investment, if there is funding gap, it's because they lack business case. 
just to give you an example, uh, in a recent study called Net Zero Europe, uh, McKinsey shows that 60% of the necessary investment to be done before 2030 to transition to a net zero Europe do not have viable business case. So in, in this situation, you can't expect uh, with all the EU taxonomy in the world, all the sustainable finance action plan, you can't expect private finance to fill and to bridge this green funding gap. You will have also to unlock public finance. So it will be both. It will depend from the moment, but we can't only rely on private finance. We have to rethink the way we see and we perceive uh, what has to be done by public. The second fact is, as Roberto mentioned, uh, the fact that public debt stock increased. It's true, we all, all know that. This is uh, some uh, number uh, and some debt to GDP ratio of different countries. I just want to bring your attention, so you can see the, the in the blue see it's the, the European one, but you can see other countries of the OECD. I want to bring your attention to uh, the case of Japan. So we all know it's about 250% debt to GDP. But what's also evident for everyone is that Japan has really no issue of debt and sustainability. It has no issue to service its debts. It's really not a problem. But to have a counter example, you can see the case of Ukraine, where in 1990, they had basically to default to restructure the a stock of debt of 40% debt to GDP. So you can see with these two very extreme examples that it looks like debt to GDP ratio is not really the best source of debt sustainability. But if it's not the stock of debt that can really be a source of debt sustainability, what are the other criteria? Which other factor determine debt sustainability, which is really an important question for, for the European fiscal framework? Basically, I don't know if you already heard about debt sustainability analysis, DSA. It's the sort of exercise which is done uh, by the European Commission, by national independent fiscal institution, by central banks, by IMF, to try to assess if a stock of debt is sustainable or not, and if a country is. For that, they look at different type of factor, among which this six type of factor. Unfortunately, today, the presentation is quite short, so I won't really have the time to dig into each and every of them, but just to give you a broad overview, very quick one, the future government revenue, so it's related to taxation, obviously. The cost and maturity of debt is the interest rate, obviously, and the debt servicing cost, what you have to pay each year to service your whole stock of debt. The difference between your interest rate and growth rate, the what we call the RG differential. The existence or not of fiscal risk, the sort of risk that could have an impact on your budget in the long run. The fact, for example, for the state who have given be guaranteed to companies in the moment of COVID, for example. Also, investor belief and perception, which determine their risk premium. Um, if marketing that you're going to, to have an issue to reimburse your debt, you can enter in a self-fulfilling uh, sort of crisis like the one we saw with the European debt crisis. Uh, but also, last point, the type of debt order. Uh, is your stock of debt held dom uh, domestically by your own citizen, own banks, own uh, investment fund, or by foreign investor? It could also have an impact in the long run on your debt sustainability. So it looks like it's a bit more complex to judge debt sustainability to that only looking at debt to GDP. But what we have to keep in mind is that debt sustainability analysis is a probabilistic exercise. You can't really even, while looking at this six type of factor, having a clear answer about the sustainability of debt of a country. And in any case, it's subject to uncertainty because you can still have a tail event that will have an impact and you can't really predict them in advance is the idea. But if the debt stock increases, what's also increased is the debt sustainability. So as we discussed, one of the factors was the cost of debt. It's the debt servicing cost, which is not just the interest rate on the new debt you issue, but what we, you have to pay to service your old stock of debt. So as you know, states, because they are eternal, they don't really have to repay the principal of the debt. In general, what they're doing is that they roll, roll over the stock of debt, meaning that when one bond arrives at maturity, they basically just reissue a new bond to fund the other one. And what they really have to pay is the, the, the cost of interest and the cost of delivering the stock of debt. It's what we call debt servicing cost. As you can see here, back in 1995, for all the, the one for the most important country of the Euro area, it was between 3.5 and 13% GDP to service its debt. Nowadays, 2021, it's just between 0 and 3% of the GDP. What means that servicing public debt has really cost so little, even 
with higher depth, depth stock. It's really important to keep that in mind. It's really not a, a big problem for the budget nowadays. If uh, debt servicing cost uh, is so low, it's obviously because long-term interest rates also lowered to, to time. So this is a graph of the evolution of long-term sovereign interest rates. So for sovereign bonds of 10 years, is the, it coming from the European Central Bank database. You can see for the same set of country that in 1993, it was between seven and 13% with the, the case of uh, Greece at, at a much higher level. And now in 2021, it's between uh, zero and 3%. So it can obviously explain why the debt service cost is so low. The question is, is it going to last this interest rate? Why interest rates are so low? Uh, it's really an important, interesting question. You have a lot of uh, work on this question, a lot of uh, scientific paper and explanation hypothesis. Again, we won't really have the time to, to dig into this, but I just want you to keep in mind that uh, there are several parts of the explanation, but the explanation of why we have low, low long-term interest rate has several um, block of explanation. The first is structural. So you have high level of savings, which can be explained by demographic change. The fact that we have an older population in Europe, in the developed world, uh, we have a higher level of inequality. So more supply of capital, which basically can have an impact on interest rate. We also have accommodative monetary policy since a long time. So it's a low key central bank interest rate, but also the asset purchase program, quantitative easing, and so on and so forth. So this part is a monetary policy choice, but we also have policy choice that has been made. For example, the fact that we, we build, we create the EU financial assistance capacity, which is the European stability mechanism, basically has a strong impact on what is called risk premium, which is basically uh, the, what is asking by financial markets um, to cover the risk that you can default. Since we have built this European stability mechanism, markets know that normally each member state can be supported and there is not that much risk uh, of a default. Therefore, the risk premium is low. You also have low co-inflation and other type of uh, policy choice. For example, the fact that sovereign bonds are designed as a risk-free asset in prudential regulation, capital requirement directive, and in the CB market operation. So all of this can explain why we have historically low interest rates. So in many cases, structural, in many other cases, it's policy choice. And so we could partly make the decision to ensure it's still uh, the case for that to ensure that um, sovereign has low interest rates in the long run it could be a decision. The last point uh, I want uh, to, to develop a bit here is the emergence of new risk, but also of new fiscal risk. So. We all know, uh, we are pretty aware nowadays of the risk of climate change, the risk on the long run. We know, uh, and you have probably already heard the, the, the idea of climate related financial risk, basically, the, the, the idea that climate change will have an impact on financial stability on banks' balance sheet. Um, but what is a bit less known and less understood is that climate change can also be a fiscal risk and also have an impact on public budget in the long run. And for the first time this year, the OBER, which is the Office for Budget Responsibility, which is an agency set up by the UK government to, to make forecasts about fiscal risk, about budget, about inflation. And this year, in the fiscal risk report that they do each year, they uh, try to estimate the size of the UK's climate-related fiscal risk and the impact it could have on the UK stock of debt in 2050. They try different uh, scenario of action. And what you can see here is that uh, in the case of an early action scenario, climate change will have an impact of plus 20% debt to GDP by 2050. In the, the case of a late action scenario, it could have as much as plus 45% debt to GDP uh, by 2050. What's important to understand here is that it's good that we are trying to do this sort of assessment and estimation. But also one of the difficulties with climate change is that it's not the type of risk that you can really assess. You have radical uncertainty there. We don't know, no one knows what's going to happen if we reach, breach tipping point. We don't know what a world at plus four, plus five degree look like and what's going to be the impact, what the, the sort of cost uh, the, the public and the government will have to, to, to bear. 
but it's just good to to at least start to understand that it exists so these are the five points important funding gap more stock of debt but increased debt sustainability because long-term low interest rates but we are facing also emergence of new fiscal risk if you want more detail you can take a look at our report fiscal meteorology unmasked so to enter in the core of the discussion what is the european fiscal framework we call it the maze because it's really complex you have many different uh, part and block uh, to this fiscal framework it's not just one regulation but we'll discuss that a bit later so what is it it's a set of rules that aim at constraining eu member state fiscal policy it has been put in place in 1992 to reduce contagion risk uh, it was felt as needed because we were entering in an incomplete European monetary union this country that really didn't really trust each other and had different sort of economic tradition uh, we won't have the time to dig into detail again but just keep in mind the, the, the most important rule is the, the two debt rules. The first one is the one that you all know is the, the fact that debt to GDP is supposed to be below 60% of a country GDP. What you have to know is that 60% is not an uh, economic sound choice. It's not based on econometric analysis that show that below this level, beyond this level, you can have an issue with debt unsustainability. It was just the average of the e public debt back in the day, and it looked like a good uh, limit to, to set. And now we are just stuck with it because it's in the European Treaty. The second one is the debt reduction benchmark. It's the, it has been added in 2011 as part of the six pack. Is the, is the requirement to when your stock of debt exceeds 60% of the GDP, what you have in excess has to be lowered by one twentieth each year. So ensure that country reduce their stock of debt uh, fast enough, if that it is even needed. But anyway, another question. Uh, we have the deficit rule, the 3% of the GDP rule. We added in 2005 a structural deficit rule, which is not another sort of deficit. Basically, the idea is that um, the structural deficit rule is the, the type of deficit you still have um, when you remove everything which is related to the economic cycle. For example, when you have a crisis, you know you will have to, you have economic crisis, you know we'll have to pay more in unemployment benefits. This type of costs are removed from the structural deficit rule. So basically it's really to see uh, everything which is not related to the the economic cycle, it requires uh, to be able to assess where you are in the cycle. Uh, it requires to be able to calculate output gap. It creates a, a lot of problem about methodology calculation, but we'll discuss that a bit later. Um, and the last one, it's uh, also a new rule, the expenditure benchmark, which is basically a sort of cap on the, the growth of member state expenditure. All these numerical fiscal rules are intertwined with the European semester, which is sort of a, a yearly process of coordination for fiscal, economic, uh, and uh, socioeconomic uh, policy in Europe, where member states uh, send their budgets, the Commission assess compliance with fiscal rules, then give recommendation to the Council that can or not uh, put sanction on member states to make it simple. You have other part of it, macroeconomic imbalance procedure and socioeconomic coordination, but we won't have time to dig into this one. Here, what I just want you to keep in mind is that if we call that a maze, it's because you have uh, the EU fiscal framework is articulated on four levels. It's grounded in primary legislation, so article of the European Treaty. For example, the article 126, which is about the excessive deficit procedure, which basically say that uh, member states shall avoid excessive deficit, defined as crossing a reference value. And these reference value I pu are put in the protocol number 12, um, which uh, the says states the 3% deficit to GDP and 60% debt to GDP value. So these are in the European treaty. It requires unanimity to be changed. But all the detail, uh, everything is developed in the secondary legislation, regulation directive, which is here. Uh, it's mainly the stability growth pact and then many reform uh, that has been made to to change and to to make it a bit more clever, able to take the context into account, but much more complex and still full of flaws. It has been uh, reinforced by intergovernmental treaty, 
such as the TCG, which has in its chapter three, fiscal compact uh, chapter, um, basically the, um, the requirement for member states to include a tighter structural deficit rule in their own national uh, national legal framework and if possible at constitutional level so basically the same than germany as with its own debt break which is in the constitution the tcg require other member states to have the same and some member states have done that and put this rule in their constitution which really create also some problem for for us uh, to think and to to really imagine what we can do to change the, the eu fiscal framework and finally, it's refined via extra legislative interpretative uh, guidelines that uh, give details on flexibility, stuff like that. More detail in our report navigating the maze. The problem. So the youth fiscal framework is in general has received a certain criticism for being insufficiently responsive to the context. It's why uh, basically it's at first it required to cut spending even when it was an economic crisis. It's why in 2011 um, and the year after, several countries, among which France and Germany, uh, didn't follow the rules and therefore uh, felt there was some need for change and it created a structural deficit uh, clause and later stage uh, other clause. But it's still uh, nowadays uh, inefficiently responsible uh, found responsive, and we have difficulty to assess the economic cycle still nowadays. Another problem is that it's indifferent to spending quality. So, as it required to reduce your, your spending when you're above 60% of GDP, which make this number it's without any economic meaning, uh, you have to reduce. And as it doesn't make a difference between a good spending and a bad spending, between spending uh, to fight the climate change or uh, reckless spending, something that is not that uh, useful. Um, in the end, because it's easier for politicians to cut investment than to cut uh, regular spending, for example, for a teacher wage uh, or salary and uh, things like that, because you can imagine it's politically more costly to, to cut uh, in wage. Um, in general, it's investment that are, uh, that are cut. And therefore, in the long run, it creates a lot of issue with our public stock of, uh, of capital, or road, hospital, and stuff like that. We added some flexibility clause in the, the European Fiscal Framework, but they are still far too restrictive. It's, uh, yeah, it's, for example, just one example, you can maximum have some leeway for 0.75% 0, 0 of your GDP for some type of investment. And it's really obviously not enough to fight climate change or to uh, to ensure we have better hospital and uh, or industrial policy or the needed uh, things. Also, it's blind to environmental and social concern. So since few years, since 2016, the European semester process integrates the uh, monitoring of environmental and social trends. So we have some data on where countries are on different uh, type of indicator, but it's still secondary. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, for fiscal and macroeconomic, you have constraining procedure that can uh, create sanction in the long run if you don't follow what is requested by the, the procedure and by the commission. But it's not the case for the environment and social. So it's really just monitoring information and then country can decide to do something or not. So as you can guess, in general, they don't really follow what's recommended when it comes to environmental and social. So we will have to give in the long run some teeth to this sort of, uh, of concern. The fourth uh, problem is um, the fact that the EU fiscal framework is asymmetric. So it can constrain deficit, but it's not equipped to force spending. In some cases, you will have country that really um, that really have uh, um, big um, trade surplus and a comfortable budgetary position, but that basically decide not to spend, and therefore it can have an impact on the aggregate demand at the EU uh, euro area level, and it can in the long run create a downward spiral, uh, a deflationary pressure, and stuff like that. And in the end, it's overly complex. It's what we call the maze, uh, but we already discussed that uh, before. More detail in our report. Last point, it's already 20 minutes, so I will have to accelerate a bit. Um, so we'll directly, uh, yeah. The first, for the moment, part of the rule are frozen. 
due to the general escape clause activation. So it will be reactivated in 2023. It will basically mean that for the moment there can't be any excessive deficit procedure launched against the country. Uh, in the meantime, the Commission is going to restart its European Economic Governance Review consultation, which means that you can have a word and a say on the future of the, pardon, of the fiscal framework uh, in the coming days. Uh, and for the part on the reform fiscal rules, there are three main options. You can first tweak the Stability Growth Pact interpretative guidance and non legislative document, um, which is just technical uh, thing that can be done by the Commission, so it's not a uh, big a deal. Uh, the option two is to reform the Stability Growth Pact in itself, and the option three is to reform the European Treaty. We'll dive a little bit. Option one, tweaking SGP interpretive guidance. It could help to clarify some point to ease certain condition, for example, for the investment clause, but it won't be enough. It could also allow to change the way we calculate output gap and so how we assess the economic cycle. And our friend from the Zanat to have very interesting proposal on how to do that, but it won't be enough to fix all the problem. But at least it can be done quite easily and can still give some leeway to states. So it has to be uh, thinking about, but we have to, to do a bit more. And at Finance Watch, and with other, we think that we need to really reform the Stability Growth Pact in itself. And these are the main uh, avenue and co potential ID. So we discussed the debt production benchmark, the fact that you have to lower your stock of debt by one ten years per year. It's obviously way too much. And if you do that now to Italy, you will basically break the recovery. So you can't continue with the debt production benchmark. And one of the ideas is to replace that by a country-specific debt pathway that would be based on a debt salinity analysis. So we would analyze the complexity of your situation uh, in function of your debt salinity. We can remark that in, in some country, they have an issue with the fact that they have too much short-term debt or too much debt that are held outside the EU. You could decide to have a debt pathway that would fix this issue. That wouldn't say that you have to reduce your stock of debt, but just to shift to a more secure type of debt. The investment clause uh, also could be a reform. First, to relax the conditionality, to allow for more public investment, but also what we should add is what is called the green golden rule, but I think we'll have the occasion to discuss uh, that later, is basically the idea to uh, remove uh, spending uh, for climate-related spending investment from the deficit rule. We could also track public spending quality uh, in the framework of the Stability Convergence Program, which are basically the program that Member State has to submit to the Commission. We could also ask Member State to basically say which part of the funding go to, I don't know, um, fossil fuel subsidy, uh, green spending, uh, circular economy, and things like that. Could improve transparency, comparability, and accountability. The European semester could also uh, prioritize SDG-related investment reform. You could do some things. And the, the last one is a bit too technical. We don't really have the time for this one. And the last option, uh, but which is more long-run action because it requires unanimity to reform the European treaty. And we could decide to scrap or relax the 3 and 60% reference value and also to better integrate sustainability imperative in the foundation of fiscal and socioeconomic pillars that are in the article 121, 26, and 48. Thank you. I know it was a, a lot of information, short amount of time, but uh, feel free to ask questions and we could discuss uh, after the conference. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ludo. Let me just put on my camera if I can. Yeah, there we go. So uh, a lot of information, uh, a lot of critical reflections, um, very interesting. And thank you for uh, yeah, making it such a clear and also um, vast presentation because it's just a very big issue, right? There's so many rules. And uh, yeah, also the scope of the discussion is beyond the rules only, of course. Um, so I have one question about the debt levels. I think that's important because also here in the Netherlands, for example, the idea is always that it's very important to not um, pass that 60% threshold of, of debt, right? Uh, in other countries, uh, they have other thoughts, as you mentioned. Uh, in Japan, uh, it's not going uh, so bad, right? So what I'm wondering uh, more in terms of forward-looking uh, and the challenges ahead, so uh, the climate crisis, 
do you think it's necessary to have uh, low debt levels to be able to tackle climate change? Because that's also uh, a narrative that is recurrent in the more frugal countries such as the Netherlands. Uh, the thing is that um, public debt in itself is neither good nor bad. And as we have seen, uh, you can't really assess the debt sustainability of a country in function of this level. And also this threshold of 60%, um, it's really arbitrary. It has no uh, sound economic background behind that. And so we have to understand that no, it's there, it's in the treaty. So for many politicians, many person, trying to say that you have to follow the rules, it's more a moral position. It's a way to show that you are fiscally responsible. It's a way of proving something more about yourself than really being, um, um, I would say that, um, economically clever, because in some cases you will have to go in debt. And as you, we have no problem of debt sustainability in Europe, we have plenty of saving, uh, but we have many uh, challenges in front of us. Um, in some cases, maybe we'll need to, to go more in depth to do the good things. But I agree with the idea that we have to differentiate between good and bad debt. Uh, you have debt to, to invest in the future. You have debt for industrial policy. You have debt to, to fight climate change. You have debt that you have to to issue to, to fund a war, for example. And you have debt because you're not uh, able to, to properly um, raise taxes to be able just to spend your everyday uh, type of spending of the state and stuff like that. It's really not the same uh, type of debt. And it's true that we should do a difference between both. But I think we should uh, take some distance uh, from this uh, obsession with uh, debt to GDP ratio. In the case of the, the climate, just to answer on this one, uh, as we have discussed, uh, climate change is also in the long run a big, a huge risk for fiscal uh, for debt sustainability, and therefore, it's, it's we can easily make a very strong case for the fact that we should do precautionary investment in fighting climate change, for the sake of debt sustainability also. So we should find a way to exclude this type of spending that would re reduce. Uh, this long-term uh, fiscal risk. Yeah, thanks. That's a very nice answer, I think. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so essentially, climate change is a liability itself that needs to be included in the calculation. Uh, otherwise, you only have one part of the calculation. Um, yeah, I have another question. Um, yeah, that goes to the question of uh, where uh, the fiscal spending uh, that should be organized uh, at what scale. So we have, um, of course, we have the national states and we have the European Union. Uh, the European Union itself has a very, very limited uh, budget. Uh, and the question is, at what scale should uh, this enlarged fiscal spending uh, come and be organized? Uh, at the moment, we know that uh, the euro, well, to function well, not to create more divergence between economies would require some form of a political union, a political union that is able to, um, yeah, to shape a much larger budget, to have much larger spending, uh, ideally also having a European welfare system. Um, so, but all of this requires uh, a lot of reforms, particularly uh, to address the democratic deficit that exists currently at the European level. So this is a sort of a long-term project. Um, where do you see what, what, the, the best possibilities to increase fiscal spending? Is it at the national states or the European Union? And if we do it at the national states, uh, do you think it should, for instance, be linked to euro bonds to make it easier for different national states to increase their spending? It's a very difficult uh, question because it's the case in many of this type of economic uh, and political economy debate is what would be ideal if you have uh, the power to change everything in, in a day and what's realistic, what, what is the situation uh, of the thinking and the, the political position in different country. So for me, in the ideal world, we should have both. We should change the EU fiscal rules to ensure that member states have more leeway to really do what they 
they will assess with their own sovereignty what they need to do. In some cases, it will be industrial policy because I, I can't really imagine how you could just expect uh, the market to, to ensure you have enough economic activity in the south of Italy. Uh, you will need in the end to have a structural and industrial policy to ensure to develop activity there. And it will take patient capital. It will take some years to rebuild uh, something there. It's the same in Belgium, in the south of Belgium, in my own country, the north of France and different other parts. Um, of Europe. And I can understand it's not really a matter of concern in Netherlands, in Germany, in other uh, country because of history, because of the industrial basis. But it's still a, a really a strong uh, issue in other country and it won't be fixed just by uh, by the market, by private finance. You, you still need public finance. And that um, it's difficult to say if it should be done just by by allowing member states to do all of that or to also do a part uh, at the EU level, I would prefer that we would have an integrated uh, European industrial policy with concrete plan to develop different type of activity in different country. But I think it will be difficult to, to have that in the in the long run. And if we decide that at EU level uh, and if we decide to issue debt, uh, it will also require uh, to repay them to have new own resource, which are still not there. So my impression is that it will take a uh, certain amount of time to go there and so in the short run because we have in front of us a very big challenge and climate change is one of them uh, we have to change eu fiscal rules to allow more leeway at national level and i think for the idea to have more uh, eu bonds we will go there but i think it will still require probably another crisis or at least some change of mind in different country um, we are at this stage in the battle of id uh, i think in netherlands you you know pretty well uh, where lie the debate. Uh, there's still some discussion to have before having enough uh, common ground in Europe to be able to, to really have a long-term EU investment uh, uh, strategy sure. and policy. If I may, a short follow-up question. It, under pressure of the pandemic, uh, many of the uh, yeah, long-standing debates almost became liquid. Um, uh, the euro bonds were almost there uh there's a facility now to, to borrow at the european level but i don't you think that it is important to share the burden of well to have a good access to, to to capital markets if we want all countries to increase their spending to meet the challenges of climate change obviously it would be useful to do that all together we know uh, it's not the same uh, same interest rate um so yes, it could be good to do that all together. But I can also hear and understood. I remember a discussion with uh, with the Perm Rep of Netherlands uh, about this uh, this type of question, and there is still some um, concern about what other countries are going to do with that. So I can understand that if we accept to borrow altogether, we also have to find a system to ensure that we know where the spending goes. And basically, it's what has been done with the RRF, the Resilience Recovery Facility, the Next Generation EU. And now we really need for this to become to be a success, to have a chance to have this type of um, EU bonds and EU investment in the long run. But we are going in the right direction, I agree with you. But still, uh, it still requires some step. Thanks a lot, Ludo. Um, before I ask the next question, uh, I see that there's also some questions put in the chat. That's great, but it would be even greater if you could also put them in the Q&A uh, tab, because then people can also endorse it and then we can make a selection. So uh, maybe to uh, Raf and to Herman, could you please also put your questions in the Q&A tab? So um, Ludo, I have a question about this green golden rule you mentioned. So uh, yeah, spending on specific green investments that don't count for your deficit, like the 3% norm. There's a big political discussion now in Europe going on, whether that's a good idea or not. So it, it might be the compromise uh, that results from the negotiations uh, taking place now. And some say, well, it's just you know a very minor measure and it's not going to change the fundamentals of the current system. And others say, well, but we actually really need it because as you pointed in the beginning, there's also really a, a lack of investment capacity now, right? So uh, we do need that rule to enable the green energy transition. Uh, what is your opinion and uh, do you think such a green golden rule could also be expanded to other areas to make uh, the necessary investments into education, for example? Sorry, Sarah, could you very briefly explain what the green golden rule is? 
Yeah, so well, maybe I'll just uh, leave that also to Ludo. Okay, thank you for this uh, excellent question. Um, so the Green Golden Rule, uh, basically, for to give you a bit of story, the, the first proposal was come come came from Germany. It was the idea of a golden rule is to say that we should exclude uh, investment from deficit rule because investment create growth and in the end it's good for you. You have more. Um, Taxation, therefore, more ability to service the debt. You just add the, so it was basically the idea that investment are sort of always good, and you should exclude them from the deficit rule. It has changed recently on a green golden rule. The idea that we should do the same, but for uh, green investment and also for green spending, because it's not just about investment; it's also about supporting uh, some sector that has to transition. Um, for me, obviously, uh, it won't change the whole philosophy of the EU fiscal rules. So the, the, this first remark is uh, still true. We could still have this larger debate, but it's uh, really a vital issue. It's really uh, the threat of climate change is very clear. As you can rem remember at the beginning of the presentation, uh, I, I quoted this, um, this report from um, McKinsey. The zero up, which basically show that all the investment we have to do before 2030 on it 60 percent has no business case. So you can't expect private finance to fund that if you don't fund that publicly, and whether you have a high level of public debt or not doesn't change anything. You have to do that, and it's not just Germany, Netherlands, and those that have some so-called fiscal space that have to do some investment. The other country too. So it's just make a lot of sense when you take a look uh, and you really realize what could be uh, the, the impact in the long run, not to try to mitigate and to do what's necessary. Obviously, it's not just Europe, huh? we are part of a global problem, but we have to do our share. Um, the cost of inaction is, and even the cost of inaction on debt sustainability, on debt level in the long run, is far greater than the cost of action. So let's agree all together that we remove each and every uh, spending investment related to climate change mitigation from the deficit rule. But then we arrive at the second point. Uh, I know there are some fears among some uh, member states in the Council that if you create this type of rule, what I heard is like, oh, but you know, Italy is going to pay in every investment and spending in green. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't allow that. So what we have to think about now is how to reassure uh, this and to create a sort of strong and logical governance that allow to say, okay, collectively, we agree that this spending and this investment, and I don't know, each uh, member state has to, to show uh, a sectoral plan and to show which part of the investment that is required to do can't be done by private, won't be done just by changing um, the, 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 the price signal by doing, I don't know, carbon price, stuff like that, but has to be uh, publicly funded and therefore uh, we have an agreement during the EU semester to stage and we just accept that okay for this uh, transport sector in Italy, in Greece, uh, in Germany, all the spending are excluded from the deficit rule. This sort of thing is not that difficult to, to put in place and to understand. So we heard that the commission is thinking about proposing a limited green golden rule. I hope it will be ambitious enough to to allow member states to to bridge this EU green funding. I, I have a, I have a brief follow up question on this, and then we go to the questions of, of uh, uh, the Q and A uh, on the politics of this. Mm -hmm. uh, aren't you afraid that uh, if an exception is made or ring fenced around uh, climate? related uh, expenditure that all other expenditure for example in the social uh, dimension in, in, in education healthcare that have suffered uh, tremendously in, in the, uh, yeah, during the period of austerity that they will not uh, the, the, yeah the cap on expenditure in these areas will not be reformed which is necessary at the moment Mm. <laughs> it's a more fundamental question you basically you you're asking is that should we put artificial constraint on what uh, EU member state can do and can decide to do? Not that sure, but here we are. We have this system. We decide this and we accept that in 1992. Now we are stuck with a debt GDP ratio and rule that make not a lot of sense. All economists agree. Um, 
so no, yes, uh, I know some person are like, yeah, if we do that for that, we will have to do four. And what's important really is to stick to the rule in some moral position. Um, this rule uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. For me, we should have more leeway. And if you're, if one country, you have a big issue with health and you really have to issue debt to be able to, I don't know, invest in more hospital, to, to train more um, doctors and nurses, then you need to, to spend some more money, some extra money and invest for 10 years. We wouldn't see any problem if it was a private company which was doing that. We all agree that private company goes in debt to insane amounts in some case uh, for investment. And it's pretty okay. Why is not the case for state? Because we always have in the back of our mind the idea that state won't spend rightly the money. They don't know how to do that. But in the end, they can know how to. You could create better rules to ensure you have the quality of spending. and. And just don't forbid all the public spending because you also need them. You can't have just the private one because you can't have just profit-driven action, a profit-driven uh, investment. You also need a uh, hospital, you also need uh, the rest. So yeah, it could open the door, but it would be uh, a door to open in my perception. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, so I, I wouldn't like to see them separate, but the joint. I think it's time to go to the to the Q and A. Uh, so the top question is uh, by um, Levi Gerbase. Um, how do you see the Greek situation in the context of these proposed reforms? You, you can uh, see the questions yourself also in the Q and A tab. Okay. Let me. We have a sort of particular case with Greece, it's true, because they really didn't follow uh, any rule at the moment. We we all know that. But then the cure was sort of problematic. Uh, it helped to fix part of the thing. Obviously, there was also a structural reform that were needed. But um, you know, when you have debt to GDP ratio, when you see that your debt to GDP ratio is increasing, uh, it can be two things. Either you have more stock of debt, either you have less GDP, and you can also have both, more debt and less GDP. In the case of Greece, you have both. For me, in the long run, uh, it's about investment. It's about ensuring that there are more economic activity uh, and stronger industrial uh, tissue in Greece uh, than about uh, cutting and spending all the time. So. In the long run, we still need to have some leeway for this type of industrial policy. I'm not an expert of the, on the Greece, Greek situation, so I prefer not to speak uh, particularly about this one. Um, but yeah, we'll have to find a way to to invest a bit more for to create a stronger economy and to ensure they have more um, higher level of sustainability. Because it's true that in their case, it can be a bit hard, and it really depends on the the ESM money. So. But I'm no expert on the Greek case. I prefer not to say. Silly no, but I, I think your um, your critique of debt sustainability analysis as they come now is very valid also for for the Greek case. So uh, we go then to the next question. Uh, that's by uh, Herman um, Michiel, and there's actually two. So let me think um, which one. Let's start with the first one. Um, what are governments supposed to do if they plan a big investment exceeding a hypothetical budget excess? The escape road of PPS seems to be closed. So what's the European Commission supposing a government to do when it wants to have a multi-annual investment program in climate, infrastructure, etc.? If the question is not super clear, I can also pick the second one because there's two questions to pick from. Uh, I read the question is true. It's not that. Uh, I guess the the question is that okay. Um, you have a plan; it's going excess of what you you have, and you you need to go in depth on that. What's going to be the the governance of this sort of system? What's always supposed to to work? Um, I don't have a very clear answer on that. And I think it should be a, a debate with the commission and, and others to try to find something that could make sense. I don't know if it should be a new type of plan uh, with concrete uh, milestone and, and step uh, to be uh, proposed and to be discussed inside a council between the member states to, to accept this or this plan. Uh, I don't uh, have a clear answer on that. I just know that we 
need to find a way to ensure member states can do this type of big investment because it can be good in the long run. I think we all agree we would like to see uh, train railway across Europe, across city um, that could be funded all together and that could go much faster for uh, for yeah, it will cost a bit less. So I don't have a clear answer to, to this one. Well, maybe just quickly, because the second question uh, is also interesting. Uh, the question there is, is it really um, the issue of rethinking the financial rules? And aren't those rules what was intended by the neoliberal new, tropism of the EU powers? It's a pretty political question. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would also mean that the powers that... Um, well, uh, will will shape the new rules, also have specific interests, and to be aware of those interests as well. But do you agree with the fundamental analysis that that these rules have um, a neoliberal history and interest? But the, just the problem with the, the wording neoliberal is that everyone puts a different meaning behind that. There is an history of what was the liberalism and when they create this new liberalism in 1938, uh, Walter Lippmann, um, um, debate, but so I don't know about the neoliberal part of it, but it's true that um, it's certain perception of the role of the state and it's a limit that you just put on the state. It's because you have more perception about the government failure, the fact that member states will not spend uh, well. And so, yes, it's also related to social struggle and other things. But nowadays, we are sort of stuck with the European Treaty as they are, and we have to, to fight to change the stability growth pact. Um, so yeah, it's true, but um, nowadays the the fight will be to change the stability growth pact. Yeah. Um, well, maybe, maybe a very brief follow up. Yeah, if yeah, whether we uh, label it new liberalism or not, uh, the the fiscal rules as they are and the, the institutional architecture behind it is focused on limiting uh the expenditure public mm -hmm. expenditure right uh, uh, and uh, it, it comes uh, through many different forms so uh the, the question would be do we need a whole new uh governing logic to make the to to, to make the eu uh, a machinery to fund expansion and more public expenditure uh that goes far beyond changing a few rules i really agree i just know it's a uh long fight and for now we are really trying to influence the, the debate on the reform of the, the stability growth pact but in the long run i really agree with you we will have in the long run to be able to have this type of initial policy decision altogether on what we think should be done by the eu and to yeah to bring back some sort of keynesianism also um, because not everything can be uh, can be done by the private sector and we just have to to acknowledge that Right, Ludo, I think we have time for one more question, and that's, I think, a very action-oriented question, which is nice. It's by Roland Kulke, and he asks, where, oh, uh, it moves, yeah, where can single states act independently in case the reform on the EU level won't be wide enough? Removing the debt break from the constitution is one possibility, because you need to know uh, a lot of countries already put the debt break in their constitution because it's mm -hmm. obligatory, right? So which other actions might exist for single governments? It's a, it's a good point. Um, they could all, all government could already try to use as much as possible the different flexibility clause that exists. It's a first step. But the second one, which has been proposed by our friend from Desernat de Kuhn's uh, macroeconomic finance uh, think tank uh, in Germany, is to reform the way you calculate the output gap. So where you're supposed to be in the economic cycle. And with their proposal, it could free some, if I remember well, 20 to 30 billion in Germany for more spending, which could have Very obviously briefly, a good... Ludo, the, the output gap, what was that again? Output gap um, is basically the, the difference between your potential GDP and your actual GDP. And right. it's supposed to be able to, to to capture where you are in the economic cycle. There are a lot of debate about the, the methodology, a lot of issue. We don't really have the, the time to go into, into detail, but there, there, there exists um, an output gap working group here at the EU level, 
with a representative from different member states and they devise how we should calculate this output gap. Uh, and it's the common agreed methodology. It has been changed several times. And Design Atukun is doing another proposal to change that, uh, that could allow to really free uh, uh, some billion of euro without any long uh, process. And in the case of Germany, this uh, equation, this uh, cal method, cal calculation method, is in a normal law and could be then changed uh, quite easily by a new coalition. Because in the case of Germany, uh, even the person that would like to, to remove or to change the debt break uh, realized that it requires a two third uh, majority. Um, and it won't happen because of the CDU CSU and FDP doesn't want to hear about it. Uh, therefore, they try to find another way and they could uh, basically change this, uh, this output gap calculation method and free 20 to 30 billion euro per year. Yeah, that's quite a lot, I'd say. So, Lulo, it's exactly uh, five, so that means that we need to wrap up. Uh, we try to answer as uh, many questions as possible from the attendees. I think we sort of managed to do most of them. Uh, thank you very much for your very uh, clear answers, I think. And, and thank you so much also for sharing your view on the future of the EU fiscal framework. Uh, it's a super important topic. And I think you also put forward very concrete proposals uh, and also made some yeah, more critical and political reflections on what's feasible and what's perhaps a struggle for, for the long run. Um, so um, if you don't mind, we'll put links on our website to all your reports so people can still check out um, what's going on there if they want to know into detail. Uh, and the recording, of course, of this webinar we will put online as well as a podcast version and uh, some, some show notes, as I mentioned. So thank you also very much participants for uh, participating in this webinar about the future of the EU fiscal framework. I hope you learned as much as I did. Um, and if you want to keep updated about the future of Crash Course, then you can sign up to our newsletter. Uh, let me just share my screen and I can show you our website over here. Um, so here's our website, uh, crashcourseeconomics.org. And if you scroll down, all the way to the bottom. I mean, of course, you need to watch all those webinars first, but once you've done that, then here you can click on signing up for our newsletter. Uh, so it would be great if you would do that. And then also, um, let me check if I can still highlight that. Uh, yeah, there's here the website of Fiscal Matters. So it's fiscalmatters.eu, um, where all the uh, events that took place during our uh, week of debate last week are um, also shared. There's a YouTube channel. You can also, uh, I think, uh, write us here if you want to become part of the coalition, if you think this is a very important topic indeed. So thanks a lot again. Uh, also, thank you team. And uh, thanks a lot again, Ludo. Uh, I hope uh, we will have many more reports to expect from you and hope to see you in Bye. the near future. And there's, I think, also quite some links in the chat. So if you think uh, you want to keep um, posted on these topics, please click on all those links. See you. Thanks a lot.